relations. OK, so communications, public relations, that sort of thing. So did you do the technical side of um, the DIY pancreas or did you work with somebody else on that part? Yes to both. Um, one of the programs that, that Alabama has sense. is the computer based honors program. They now call it something else. Um, but it's really cool because they bring in 40 very diverse students from very different majors. You have a couple of CS majors, you've got a PR major, an English major, you know, biology, mm -hmm. pre-med, everything. And the first two semesters, they teach you how to learn programming languages. So uh -huh. we learned Fortran 90 and C++, which are like really obscure. And But the point of it was if you can learn how to learn one or two languages, you can right. learn anything you need to know. And then you spend the rest of the time doing research. And so you can apply technology to whatever you care about. And I didn't realize until I graduated and then, you know, 10 years later, wanting to do this kind of DIY diabetes stuff, how useful that was as kind of a, a confidence builder. Because right. when I started building stuff and I was talking to people who were like, oh, we could do this in PHP or HTML or, you know, JavaScript or C++ or whatever language that they had. Right. I'm like, okay, cool. I know enough to be able to Google and figure out the syntax and I've got the logic constructs of the coding down. Um, mm -hmm. So I was able to, and then because I have a communications background and that's one of my skill sets, like translating plain language concepts into something that people who want to code can understand and vice versa back to the general community, that ended up being really, really helpful more so than, you know, how do you write this function in right. Python or this function in, in JavaScript? But because I had that little bit of technical ex expertise, so to speak, from that college program, it really helped me not let my imposter syndrome just get in the way. So. Oh, that's really um, awesome. Yeah. yeah, what a great outcome from that program at, at Alabama. Yeah, the other really cool thing that came out of the program is every semester you would do a research project and then you would give a presentation. And so I learned how to give presentations from that program as well. And so by the time I graduated and did professional conferences and, you know, research and now this, right. you know, I had, you know, six semesters worth of presentations. And so I had kind of you know, gotten over the hump of getting comfortable with presenting. So that was another kind of cool experience that went with it. Yeah, no, that's great. Good. Yeah, so I'm a computer science professor, so that's my background. Sort of the health and the, um, the physiology side of embodied interaction, not my strength. So I just kind of learned that as I go. And definitely not communications is my strength either. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm on the flip side where I learn I learn the tech stuff on the go as I need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Well, I see we have somebody who joined us. Um, I'm going to, I'll have you, enter, so is it Pepita? Is that how you say your name? Oh, hi, yeah, it's really late here in England, but I thought I had to come and say hello to Dana. Hi, Dana. Nice to see you. Um, Thanks for joining. <laughs> we, we've crossed paths at Stanford at conferences in the past, and I really admire everything that you've done. Um, said it before, I'll say it again. Um, Thank you so, so much. Yeah, just here to, to hear what you have to say, but don't expect much from me because it's midnight. <laughs> That's totally fine. Thanks for staying awake. That's awesome. Okay, so, uh, well, welcome. And... Uh, I think what we'll I'm afraid do I've we'll... lost your sound, so that's typical as well. So don't worry, I'll lose your sound. I'm going to put you on captions so I can read you. That sounds great. Sounds good. Good. All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so my name is Mike Jones. Um, I'm a professor of computer science at Brigham Young University. Uh, I'm interested in the role of discomfort in interactive systems, positive discomfort in interactive systems. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce um, Dana, who is speaking to us from Seattle. Uh, Dana is um, the creator of the Do-It-Yourself Pancreas System, which is a closed loop system for um, people with diabetes and the founder of the open source artificial pancreas system movement. And uh, I think you'll catch this in her talk, but she's an advocate for patient-centered, patient-driven, patient-designed research in, in uh, the context of, of medicine. And uh, she herself has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and uh, that, I think, was the beginning of the DIY pancreas project. Um, what I love about her work as somebody who thinks about embodied interaction is that um, 
It raises some really important questions and insights about things like continuous adaptation, what that really means, and what it means to put a computational system in the middle of that. Uh, the level of integration between body and system is really, really tight in her work. And I, I think that raises some interesting questions and, and points. And I, uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, your work made me do was rethink what I mean by insourcing and outsourcing, which are some terms in the embodied interaction community. So I, I really enjoyed that about your work. So uh, this is um, Dana's second talk as part of this seminary. So her first talk is also available, um, so it can be found on the Slack. And uh, this talk will be as well. I think that's all I have to say. Dana, take it away from here. That's a fabulous introduction, thank you. And I'll be really excited to hear your feedback on Autotune, which is one of the things I'll talk about um, in this talk. And this talk is a little bit different than the first one. In the first one, I dove into the premise behind why build a system, what's the point, how did we do it? And for those who didn't see the whole thing, um, just for some context here, when we talk about diabetes, I'm talking with this technology about the difference between manual diabetes, where the human is in charge of all dosing decisions and everything that they are doing by looking at the blood glucose meter or the continuous glucose monitor, looking at their injection data or looking at their insulin pump and thinking about what to do, and the shift to automated insulin delivery, where there's a computer that's looking at the data about the blood glucose, is looking at the insulin dosing data, and follows a set of rules that we give it called an algorithm to decide whether to give more or less insulin over time. So that's essentially the system I built. So you'll hear me call it a closed loop. You'll hear me call it an artificial pancreas system. Um, but this is really looking at the difference between manual insulin delivery and the outcomes that people with diabetes get with that and automated insulin delivery. So that, in a nutshell, is a summary of the previous talk. But what I want to get into is talking about the so what of that and really talking about knowledge generation. Because one of the beautiful things about OpenAPS is that it's open source. We did that so that other individuals could use it. But we also were hoping companies would use it, which I talked about last time. And we also wanted researchers and clinicians to be able to use it, whether that's the raw code or there's an idea or a concept that they wanted to use. And so you would think, okay, we've you know kind of solved all these problems. We've got this great system. Everything's solved, right? Like the diabetes world just accepts this. Well, we're not quite there yet. And part of the issue is because of the way that we think about knowledge generation, evidence generation, and evidence categorization in terms of healthcare, it has to come from the top down. It has to come from the traditional players and the traditional system. And instead, a lot of knowledge is just being completely left behind, or as I like to talk about, it's basically thrown in the trash. Because when you think about diabetes you and the devices in this system, you have a continuous glucose monitor that every five minutes is generating a data point. And the data might be used by the company, but that data doesn't know about the insulin pump data. And the insulin pump data might be used by that company. And then we've got this algorithm in the middle and so you would say, well, just have one company have all the data. That doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. And in DIY, like I mentioned, we built an algorithm and a computer to talk to those two devices. But then the companies don't know or don't care about what we're doing, whether it's insurance company, the medical device companies, and clinicians oftentimes don't care about all that nitty gritty data. And you could argue, yeah, for clinical care, it's not needed. You can look at lab results like the A1C to see how people are doing or look at high level metrics. But the reality is there's tons of data created by the system. So it's not just the data of how much insulin was dosed and what the blood sugar was, but there's all this data generated by the algorithm that says, here are variables we created to track things that no other system in the world is tracking. And so instead of capturing that data, logging it over time and being able to use it, it was just historically thrown in the trash. Now, back in 2016, um, or in 2015, we had the opportunity to present at a conference. And we wanted to share results from more than just me, the N equals one. And so we had actually done a Google survey to the community and got results from members of the community. So like the first 40 people. And as a result, we were invited to actually present that at a conference and then we were asked to publish it. So we got to publish the very first research data, even though it was just retrospective, just self-reported data. 
Um, but it was really powerful for being able to enable researchers and clinicians to see this is more than just Dana. This is more than just one person doing this thing. This is working for more people. And this data is as powerful as the first generation commercial systems and all of the research studies on all of these systems to date. But following this presentation of data and kind of starting to advocate for, hey, somebody should capture this data. It shouldn't be thrown in the trash. Even if we don't plan to commercialize this system, there are ideas and there's knowledge in this data and there's things that we can learn. But again, it's just being thrown in the trash. And it turned out that we had to build a solution for this ourselves, a data commons for ourselves. Thankfully, this, I mean, again, I'm not a technical person uh, by training, by profession. I come from a communications background that you'll probably have figured out from listening to me talk or the last presentation that I'm probably close to what you would call here in the US, a redneck engineer or somebody who is willing to put pieces together with duct tape or whatever you need to build a system to achieve a goal. So if I have a goal of how do I share my data anonymously with researchers, I'm gonna find the tools I need to pull this all together and be able to do that. And that's actually a system that we design to build a data commons, we called the Open APS Data Commons, to allow people like me to anonymously donate their data into a pool that could then be shared with researchers. And part of the reason that we wanted to have this data pool was because we were starting to hear people talk about doing research studies, which was great, but people are getting fatigued as people living their lives, dealing with these systems, and then being asked by researchers to participate in kind of burdensome studies that weren't really designed with people in mind. So one of the reasons we had a data commons is that if people could anonymously donate their data into one place, I and a group of people that were chosen by the community could then dole that data out to researchers and kind of prevent the fatigue from constantly asking individuals for their data to prove something that we knew worked, but to you know prove it on a bigger scientific scale. So we ended up leveraging a platform called Open Humans. Open Humans was an existing nonprofit organization and really cool data platform that allows people to use it to store their own data personally. And you could also donate your data to projects and there's different uploader tools. So you can upload, you know, wearable tracker fitness data. You can donate diabetes data by uploading to that. So we actually built some custom uploaders for diabetes data to make it easier to get that data into open humans. And then we created a project called the Open APS Data Commons that allowed people to join it. And so what's on the slide here is just showing that people would take their data from their self-collected Night, Night Scout site. They would use a data transfer tool, get it into open humans, and then they could decide to share it with our project or any other project. And the other benefit to introducing our community to open humans was it was a secondary place where you could store your data. Um, a lot of us were using things like Mongo, DB and Heroku and other things to manage our own personal data. So we had kind of self-collected data, but obviously if you accidentally deleted your data out of there, you didn't have it anywhere else. So we kind of encourage data donation, not only to fuel research, but also for individuals to say, this is a great place to store another copy of your data. And we did. And so I've been kind of the key administrator, administrator of the Open APS Data Commons for the last four years, I think it's been. And for this presentation, I actually went back and looked and tried to see how many people had requested the data. And it looks like we've had over 100 requests for data from the data commons over the past four years. But it's not just as simple as having the data, creating a place to store it, and then saying, ta-da, world, please use this data. My observation has been over the past four years is that traditional researchers aren't quite equipped to work with this data set for a number of reasons one of which is OpenAPS was, and I guess technically still is, brand new as a concept. And the data structures we use of the data from blood glucose to insulin dosing to the actual algorithm decisions is something that the researchers weren't familiar with. So there was kind of a learning curve for them to understand what this data set even had, how the data was structured and how they could work with it. And I also was hearing from different researchers. Some were you know, practicing clinicians who didn't really have any tech or analytical skills. Some were you know, machine learning science, data scientists and people who were experienced with working with data science and these data sets, but didn't have the diabetes knowledge. So I had to both teach a lot of people technical stuff of how to work with the data and also teach other researchers a lot of diabetes stuff, which was kind of interesting. Um, but one of the things I also had to do because I was trying to give out this data and people weren't using it because they got frustrated with, I don't know how to work with this data. So I actually created a series of open source tools to process the data. 
Um, part of that was to solve my own frustration because the data that came into Open Humans and came into my data commons was based on JSON. And JSON is a data structure that's used by Night Scout, so that's just how we got the data. Well, for me and a lot of people, we are familiar with doing uh, data processing in spreadsheets, which I know horrifies a lot of data scientists. But for non-data science people who don't use R and Python and other data analysis, things like that, you know, getting a CSV file, opening it in Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel is kind of a common experience, and especially for a lot of the researchers that I was working with. So I wanted to convert my data from JSON to CSV to be able to open it in Excel or Google Sheets. The challenge was because this data is from this open source system where you can have any number of devices for CGM, pump, the algorithm of choice, there's basically kind of an infant number of structures within the data sets for each individual. And it's not the same from person A to person B to person C. And so you basically had a complex data scheme in JSON that didn't really convert with headers to CSV really easily. And so I went out looking for a converter tool and one really didn't exist. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I finally found a web tool where you could do it on the web, but not on your computer and not with a big set of data. So I actually, as again, non-programmer, non-technical person kind of hacked together a conversion of this tool to something that I could run command line on my computer to convert these giant data sets from JSON to CSV and put together a package, released it and had instructions up online. And then I also started putting other scripts in here of here's how to you know, get basic statistical data out of this to get you a picture for how many people, how many days of CGM data, how many days of pump and really basic stuff like that, which to a data scientist would be like, oh, I can do that in five seconds or five minutes. Um, but to somebody without experience with big data sets, without experience with any of these data science programs, that was a huge barrier. And so that's one of the things that we had to do was, or I had to do was create these tools, make them available. And so now when I give out the data set, it's here's the data, I've got it converted to you for CSV, but then here's all these tools that go with it. Um, because some people want to convert it or use raw JSON or whatever. So I give it out gzipped with JSON and CSV conversions, and I give them a link to this tool set. And then I also ask people to consider giving their tool sets back to us so that when we in the community want to do research, we can continue to do so. Um, a lot of the research that's been done on this data is really basic. One of the first research studies we did on this pool of data was really basic, but Back when we were first doing this and we had the first kind of couple hundred users and the first donated data sets, people were still really concerned about, does this work? Is it safe? Is it effective? So we did a really basic study looking at how blood sugar changed over time when people adopted the system. And so we had really cool visuals like this showing blood sugar comes down over time, the variation gets better. Um, and then I started generating charts of, okay, we have multiple studies now with different people looking at retrospective data sets, either from the data commons or also gathering data from people in different countries. And they generally all show the same thing. Your time spent in target range went up, the bad stuff went down, no adverse events, that's great. But it was really interesting for me over time as we generated more data and more evidence, one of the biggest pushbacks I heard from the traditional world, from clinicians, from researchers, from the system, was there's no evidence that open APS and open source automated insulin delivery works. And what they're really meaning by this, because I would provide them evidence, I'm like, hello, I'm alive. This system is working, I am still using it, I have no adverse events, um, and other people did too. But even again, that N equals 40 self-reported data or that first data study that I just showed you with all those dots, what they really meant was not that there was no evidence, but that there wasn't the perfect gold standard evidence that they wanted. And there's not really ever going to be the perfect evidence. And what we have to do is kind of contextualize evidence and think about what are the benefits and what are the challenges of things like retrospective self-donated data or retrospective collected by clinicians data or then observational data that we collect all the way to RCT. And over time, all of these studies have been done on open APS and similar systems. We have N equals one case studies in the medical literature, and I'll share some of these in a minute. We've got retrospective. Somebody ported our algorithm and did an in silico study. There have been observational studies and there's even an RCT that was funded, done in New Zealand and the results are coming out next year, which I'm really, really excited about. But all of these studies were just looking at basic outcomes in terms of glycemic outcomes. 
did people's blood sugar get better? How much more time did they spend doing okay compared to before? And there's a lot of untapped potential in this data that's been sitting there now for years with hundreds of people. And that's really frustrating to me because as the person with diabetes, I know that there are an endless number of questions that we can answer now that we've bothered to collect this data from individuals and we have this really amazing pool. We can learn things and address questions in diabetes that weren't possible before because of the burdens of tracking things like manual behaviors or doing clinical trials. We have this amazingly rich data set that is not being used to its potential. And I'm limited by not being a data scientist um, or, or a clinical person, right? So like the, the research that I do is limited by my capabilities, which is why I love partnering with other researchers and starting to address some of these questions. But one of my big calls to action is saying, you know, when you hear about problems like this, it's really easy to turn around and be like, well, you should do this in X and Y and Z. But the reality is there's so much we can do right now while we wait for, you know, the perfect evidence or the better evidence, like we can do so much more. But a lot of it comes down to recognizing where this knowledge, where this data exists. And I have something that I call the patient syndrome trap, which I see happen all the time. And this happens with regards to data and it happens with just ideas and innovations and solutions that people come up with because it's like imposter syndrome where you feel like everybody else around you in the room knows so much more than you do. Well, in healthcare, people act like patients don't know anything when in fact, patients do know quite a bit, but we act like healthcare professionals or researchers or people who work in the healthcare system know everything that patients do. And so patients shouldn't even speak up or shouldn't be talking about whatever because you know it's already covered. The reality is most of what patients know is not known by clinicians, is not known by researchers, and is not known by the healthcare system, which means in the future, when a patient is diagnosed with something and they go to their doctor, their doctor doesn't have all the information. They don't know what it's like to live with the chronic illness. They don't know about the problems or the solutions that exist. But because of this perception that healthcare professionals know everything, and because of the way our system is set up to block knowledge coming from the bottom up, unless you jump and kind of go through let me present at the conference, let me present in the literature, most of that knowledge just stays within the patient community, which means other patients who don't look into that community miss out on that information, which is really frustrating for me. So one of the things I want to continue to advocate for and make sure people know is that there's all this information and knowledge out there, and the current systems aren't working. People are falling through the gaps. Healthcare providers, as many of you may have heard about, are getting burnt out from COVID and many other reasons but we just, we need more hands. So instead of slapping hands of patients who say, hello, I have an idea, I want to help, or I have data, where do I give it? You know, creating that infrastructure, creating those systems to allow input and knowledge generation coming from patients. So I'm going to talk about some of the really cool things that we've learned and done research on in the diabetes community from patients, because we've been able to small solve really small problems one at a time. And one of the things, Mike, that I was excited to mention because of what you talked about, your interest and your background, is a tool we created called Autotune. And I mentioned this in the previous um, Q&A session from the previous session where MC was asking about, you know, something we've learned by collaborating with other people. We learned that people don't like to change their settings or they're not good at changing their settings. And it's really hard to hear from another person, even if you ask for help, how you should change your settings. So we created a tool that actually categorizes data and determines whether you need to change setting A, B, or C. And it actually generates a report and says, here was your setting before, here's what it should be now. And then we also attempt to visualize how much data went into that decision so you can tell, okay, there's not a lot of confidence in this number, but there is more confidence in this number. And then you can decide how you wanna adjust from there. So that's a tool that we created and it's something that does not exist commercially. It does not exist and so doctors can't really do settings for their patients other than looking and eyeballing the data and using their knowledge. But we hear more and more about tools like AI and different things for like looking at radiology data. Um, In some cases, they're working really well. In some cases, they're not working really well. But this is open source. So this is the kind of thing that can be studied more than what I am capable of study of saying, how does this compare to human generated decisions, either by the person with diabetes or the clinician? But in general, anecdotally, and the studies we've done have so far have shown that Autotune works really well at helping people adjust their settings in the direction it needs to go. 
and getting better results either using the closed loop system, but it's also being used by people not using closed loop systems. And in fact, there's such a demand for help changing settings that a portion of the community who's not using an insulin pump, who's using injections, came in and said, hey, I know your tool is not for this, but I tried it. I put in my injection data, simulated like it was an insulin pump, got back the information, translated it back, and I used it to decide how much to inject with my multiple daily injections. And they found that that helped them better than what they had before. So there's all this stuff that we have learned in the diabetes community that, again, because of where it comes from and because there's no commercial incentive to try to sell it or get it regulated, the system, the healthcare system, doesn't really have a way to bring that knowledge in and start using it and testing it unless somebody decides that there's a commercial opportunity there. And there's other concepts and things that we've learned in diabetes, such as about the timing of insulin as it relates to food. We realized very early on for me, when I was using my open loop system, that if my insulin was reduced overnight in order to prevent a low blood sugar overnight, I would get a perfect blood sugar. But then the first time I ate, my blood sugar would rocket up really fast and it didn't matter what I was eating, anything would cause it. And it turns out the reason is because my body hadn't had any insulin activity. And so all of the food that I hit would go straight into the bloodstream as blood sugar, driving my blood sugar up. Whereas when I had insulin activity going and kind of priming the body, that insulin could capture and bring the blood glucose, the carbs and stuff into the cells and into the muscles and not just release straight into the bloodstream. And so we realized there was kind of this cause and effect or correlation of insulin timing. And so we developed this model called Eating Soon, where we used a lower target than normal to simulate getting more insulin going sooner so that the physiological response of the body to food would result in a flatter line. And that's something I used again in an open loop setting and then started using in the closed loop system. And many other people in the diabetes community use that today. But that's something that is just kind of anecdotal community knowledge that's been proven in the data, but not to the point of having, you know, really good um, prospective clinical trials or RCTs of people testing this different method versus what's been done for the last 30 years, which is manually dose insulin 15 minutes before a meal, which is flawed for a bunch of other reasons. But this idea of how do you test these different strategies that the community has come up with, and at least a good portion of them finds effective, we don't really have good mechanisms for the healthcare system to take in this knowledge and build upon it with more research. So that's something I'm hoping to see change. But one of the things that I think that the open source community has done really well has been to tell our stories and share our data and basically live our lives while using these open source systems. And so we have now case studies published in the literature about all kinds of scenarios that traditionally the healthcare system wouldn't get to until much later. It's prove safety and efficacy first, and then make it a little bit better and then kind of figure out how to market it to these different populations. And then, you know, in five or 10 years, we might get around to here's how system A that was approved 10 years ago can be used for exercise. And that's a really long time. And people are not going to stop exercising um, or wait for the perfect here's how to do it. So we have case studies about exercise. This is one that I've captured talking about a half marathon, but I can say I've run a marathon and an ultra marathon. Other people have done big triathlons, Ironmans, all kinds of physical activities using these open source systems. Obviously, we're still alive. We got really good results. We keep using it. Um, But there's a lot of great data around exercise. And also, thankfully, there's many people who have chosen to experience pregnancy or were trying to get pregnant and used open source automated insulin delivery and got really great results because they and their clinicians used it and then also have documented in some of the literature, which I think is fantastic. And this one, this upcoming one is not a study, but I think it's a really cool data point of things that matter to patients that clinical teams don't always think about studying is a quality of life impact of sleep. And my favorite sleep anecdote beyond my own personal story of feeling safe to sleep at night is from somebody who tweeted about how she started using an open source closed loop system after her newborn baby arrived. And she started getting more sleep with a newborn baby because she was using an open source automated insulin delivery system than she did in you know decades prior of living with diabetes which i think is so wild i don't have kids but i have nieces and nephews and i've heard stories about newborn babies not sleeping and so it's very mind-blowing to me and probably is to a lot of other people who've experienced that that you might actually get better sleep with the newborn baby than what you had before which i just think is a really great story but again people 
with a brand new newborn baby are not going to be recommended to start on a commercial device or a new medical device, but she was able to make that choice and make the series of decisions to use it. And obviously worked out really well for her. And some of the other data that's starting to come out that I think is really interesting is there's studies now starting to compare the open source and the commercial systems side by side, which is really great in one regard, because there's more safety and efficacy data showing this working on par or better than some of these commercial systems. But this is still just looking at those higher level metrics, like what is the average blood sugar? How much time did you spend in range? And that is only one tiny piece of the puzzle, because like I was talking about with quality of life and sleep, there's other quality of life impacts to using the system. So one of the things that I've been advocating for with open source and commercial systems is to start to figure out how do we as the diabetes community, both clinicians and researchers and patients, how do we quantify the amount of work and upkeep to keep these systems going on a daily basis? Because with the first generation commercial systems, you have to enter a meal and you have to enter a pre-bolus, like I talked about, bolus for the meal and give some insulin for the meal to, to balance the timing of the food and the insulin. And there's other things that you have to do to keep the system going, like calibrate the CGM. That's a lot of work on a daily basis. It's less work than you would do without the technology, but it's still a lot of work even though the technology is helping you get even better results. And so one of the things we need to start doing is quantifying how much work, how many times did somebody have to touch the device or look at their data or think about what the system was doing in order to get really great outcomes. We actually published a case study or presented a case study at one of the big diabetes scientific conferences a couple years ago. And it's one of my favorite case studies because it was a teen who shared his data with me and his dad and he consented to share this data. Um, but this is a, teen, male teen, who would eat 200 grams of carbs per day, which is considered to be a little bit higher maybe than the average person, did not input into the system that he was eating or what he was eating, the specific amounts, did not meal bolus. And he is getting an ideal, um, you know, at target range A1C and has actually maintained that for three years, despite teen life and eating everything and not just basically carrying the system with him, but not touching it ever, which is mind blowing because this is basically going from a hybrid closed loop system where the human is still interacting it with it, especially around meal times, to essentially a fully closed loop system that yes, you go out of range sometimes, but this teen is saying, look, I want a hands off device and I'm willing to occasionally go high and low and still get really great results overall and way better than what he had before. And to him, that's worth it. And in that same presentation, I shared other data that we can actually simulate what happens when you do touch the system frequently versus not touching it by telling it meals and not. And we can start to quantify what amount of work gets you what results. And I think that's something we have to move towards with medical devices is not just say, okay, if you do these 18 behaviors, this is what the result everybody gets, but start to quantify and separate what happens if you skip one of those behaviors or a, a cluster of behaviors? How do the outcomes change? How does that impact the quality of life the input work of doing it and how you're feeling, as well as the clinical outcomes. And related to this, I think Sulkaharo um, captured some data really early on. He had a young child with type 1 diabetes, and he was looking at the number of manual dosing that he and his wife and the grandparents were doing for the child before and after initiating open APS. And this was 2014, 2015, so very, very early data before the algorithm got to the point of being hands off like the last slide. But you can still see very visible jumps down when in manual entries when they started using a closed loop system versus what they had before. And this is the kind of thing that I want to see all medical devices, right? Every app, it's not just, okay, you can get, you know, 15% better mental health, but how much work did you have to put into it? How much, you know, thought and interaction do you have to do? Like that's something overall in terms of healthcare and society that I think we have to figure out. And then also, we do have to think about healthcare providers and how they're learning to interact with this technology because it's changing the way that they work. And actually, as of today, this is a fresh slide, um, perfectly timed. We had a new publication come out of the RCT. It's not the RCT data that's still pending, but it's our first publication actually looking at the experience of the healthcare providers in the RCT using the open source software because we had set up a Slack learning community to enable clinicians from the different sites to be able to share and ask questions of what they were doing. Um, so I've got the citation there. I'm happy to post an author copy of the article there. But one thing that I wanted to highlight was 
the, the kind of key result was that the technology itself, the algorithm and everything, the newness of the open source stuff wasn't the key troubleshooting issue for patients and for providers. That was really about like the basic pump and the connectivity with the phone and so kind of device issues that were outside of the diabetes specific stuff. But what I thought was really interesting is that one of the key challenges um, when discussing AID related topics, we had experts like me on the team to help train and support the team throughout the study, because obviously having built the algorithm, having done a lot of research, we have a lot of expertise in how the system works and can consult with them, even though they decide, right, what happens for their patients. And most of the conversations around the open source technology leveraged the expert knowledge, AKA patient knowledge of open source automated insulin delivery, which I think is really interesting. And it kind of begs the question of, you know, how do we involve patients who are experts in their situation and experts in their solution as this knowledge does get shared from the bottom up? And I always advocate we should pay people for their time. So involve patients, pay them for their time, pay them to be parts of designing studies and supporting study staff as we look at those innovations. And I think that's one thing that's really important. But I'm going to wrap up and then save time for questions. But I kind of want to close with a couple of points about what I constantly hear the barriers are. So when we think about this bottom-up concept of knowledge generation from the healthcare system or to the healthcare system, the system itself throws up a lot of barriers that I've heard over the years, which I've kind of alluded to briefly. But one of them is being told that self-reported data isn't good, when in fact, there are plenty of studies that show that self-reported data is pretty accurate. And honestly, any data is better than none is kind of my opinion on this, but I constantly hear self-reported data isn't good as kind of a, you should stop studying this, you should stop working on this because self-reported data isn't good, which is kind of silly and we'll talk about that. Uh, another thing I hear is, well, you're not a doctor or you're not a data scientist. Well, no, they're busy and they don't have the insight and expertise I do, so I'm going to keep working on this. But I think it's silly that we in healthcare gatekeep based on credentials if you don't have an MD by your name that you shouldn't be adding knowledge to the system, that's silly and we lose knowledge by assuming that only traditional researchers, PhDs or MDs are the ones who can add knowledge to this space. And the other thing I hear about is ethics, but instead of saying, what is your process for safeguarding ethics? I hear, what about IRB? So in the US, that's the Institutional Review Board. It's typically housed at an institution or you can pay for an external one. And they are in charge with reviewing the ethics plan for your research and then rubber stamping it and saying you can do it or not. But IRB is actually a requirement by institutions, not by the journals, not by researchers. Um, and so because I'm outside of an organization, I do ethics, we do consent with our research and everything, but I only do IRB when I'm partnering with somebody whose university requires it and we go through their IRB. And so the conversation is a little bit off because again, instead of talking about ethics, which is the point of IRB, People act like if you don't have IRB rubber stamping your research, then any research generated is just completely non-usable, which is not the case. So when we think about moving forward to address some of these barriers and to address some of those concerns, we need to change the conversation so that, okay, maybe you had an experience with self-reported data where it wasn't as high quality or as accurate as you wanted it to be, but don't project concerns about a single data set on all self-generated data because that's not the case. I would love to see us assess and grade and come up with a way to say, yes, this data has been de deemed you know, high quality or good enough and there's no reason we shouldn't research on it. We can caveat it and say, this is retrospective self-collected data, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be used as a building block of evidence. Similarly, I would love for us to come up with ways to evaluate the ethics of research without requiring rubber stamps of IRB. In my personal experience, having done some IRB approved research and some non, I've been asked to do non-ethical things as a researcher by the IRBs because they are really designed to protect the institutions. And this is probably a very controversial opinion um, that IRBs sometimes request or require unethical behaviors by research, but I have seen it at multiple institutions here in the United States, and I don't think that's okay. And so I've pushed back on those things and gotten exceptions, but I don't think returning data to people is unethical. And I don't think that should be an exception that you have to push back and fight for against the ethics boards that are supposed to be safeguarding ethics when in fact, they're kind of doing the opposite. So IRB is not the perfect solution to ethics. And I think we need to do more in assessing whether ethics 
have been done well with different research studies and with communities. And then also, again, I think we need to let go of kind of that expectation that an institution or the credential somebody has is a proxy for quality or the impact of research. I can give you tons of examples outside of diabetes in the patient communities where really impactful research or innovation has happened, but again, not a credential, not in an institution, and they don't have an incentive to commercialize it, and so it just gets overlooked or put down compared to other ineffective things that are brought through the traditional research system by traditional researchers. So that's another thing that I would love to see change, again, because there's so much we can do from the bottom up and top down, and it's really a conversation about yes and. I'm not saying take the jobs of clinicians or researchers or change everything. I'm saying yes to what we're doing and we can do more, we can do better, we can leverage information, we can leverage more people, and we can solve more problems and create better healthcare for everybody, which I think is the goal of people working in healthcare, professionally, traditionally, as well as the goal of patients. We care about safety, we care about better health. So I'm optimistic that moving forward, some of these barriers facing people like me and these communities who are doing research will be faced and we'll get a lot more knowledge and information out there. But with that, I will pause and see what questions people have. And I'm also, for those who are watching this recorded, happy to address questions on Slack over the next couple of days. So don't hesitate.